I want to welcome everybody back uh, to the uh, housing track of the OPD planning and zoning conference. Um, this uh, third session um, is titled of the housing track is titled how much housing does New Hampshire need? Um, we have today with us Heather McCann, the director of housing research at New Hampshire housing. Um, actually, Heather has a new title, but I'm sorry we didn't catch the update on that. Um, Zach Swick, who's the senior GIS analyst at the Southern New Hampshire Planning Commission, and Kayla Tavares, who's the planning director at the North Country Council. Just want to go over some session logistics here real quick. The meeting controls are located in the ribbon located at the top of your screen as depicted on the slide. There are icons to raise your hand, to open the chat box, to react, and to change the screen view during your present according to your preference. If you have a question during the sessions, during the session, please put it in the chat box. We'll do our best to answer them as we keep going. We actually have a lot of slides to cover for this, so we're going to go through a lot of materials. So yes, please put your questions in the chat box and we'll try our best to respond to them before we kind of change topics. Turn it over to my uh, colleague Heather for a minute to introduce herself and New Hampshire Housing. Yes, hi, good afternoon, Heather McCann um, from New Hampshire Housing. Um, and I just wanna give a brief background for those who may not be familiar with our organization and what we do. Um, so we're a self-supporting public benefit corporation that promotes, finances, and supports affordable housing. Um, we operate rental and home ownership programs uh, designed to assist low and moderate income persons with obtaining affordable housing. We're not state employees, but we're entrusted with the administration of a variety of federal and state level resources to help carry out our mission. Um, and we have several operational divisions. Um, we help make home ownership accessible and available to low and middle income residents of New Hampshire. Um, our multi multifamily rental housing division helps finance and refinance and preserve affordable apartment buildings across the state. Um, and our assisted housing division helps some of the most vulnerable citizens um, in New Hampshire with rental assistance vouchers and related services. And so I oversee the research engagement and policy team um, where we focus on data and research projects like the um, housing statewide housing needs assessment. And um, we also focus on uh, community outreach and engagement and education. Great, and um, as many of you know, um, the New Hampshire Office of Planning and Development, um, we moved over here from the Office of Strategic Initiatives within the, um, or the former planning division at the Office of Strategic Initiatives in July of 21. So we're coming up this summer on our two year anniversary. Um, so we're now within the Department of Business and Economic Affairs. Um, we have four programs um, that we run, the Municipal and Regional Assistance Program, the Floodplain Management Program, the State Data Center Program, and our Geographic Information System GIS Program. Each of these programs provides technical assistance um, to all stakers, stakeholders for OPD's different programs um, through training, um, providing coordination, providing data, as I already said, technical assistance, and just providing a variety of resources. Um, this conference also being our kind of annual opportunity to provide educational opportunities to planning and zoning board and other local land use board members. Okay, sorry, and this one's me, but I had a second, a little bit of struggle while they're taking control of the slides. Um, so Zach and I work for the regional, two of the regional planning commissions in the state, but the regional planning commissions are a function of state government. We are established under RSA 3645, but we operate independently. There are nine regional planning commissions across the state of New Hampshire, and we cover all of the municipalities in the state, including non places that aren't actually municipalities, our village districts and unincorporated places as well. And so we work to provide regional planning services to the communities and those regions as a whole.
Okay, so um, our statewide need st assessment is published on our website currently, and the report provides information and insight to better help us understand our housing challenges and opportunities as a state, and can be used as a tool to help make data-driven decisions about our housing needs. Um, we worked with Root Policy Research to conduct our statewide housing needs assessment. Um, Root Policy uh, Research is a community planning and housing research firm that is based in Denver, Colorado. And so um, what we'll see for statewide findings in the report, um, statewide findings in the presentation are the, the core findings that are in the report. Um, and just listed out here is the report framework and how the report is broken up <clears throat> and the sections um, that we have provided within that report. So the regional housing needs assessments actually follow. We also worked with root policy research and we worked with all of the nine regional planning commissions at the same time, as well as the staff at OPD and New Hampshire housing. So we honestly had a great opportunity to sort of collaborate and inform each other back and forth in this whole process. But a little bit of context on the regional housing needs assessment. They are one of the mandated functions of the Regional Planning Commission. So they're one of the required duties for us all to do on behalf of and in support of the municipalities. The ultimate goal is to assist municipalities in developing their local master plans and having solid information to base housing needs and future projections on. We do this work every five years and on the right side of the slide here, you'll see what our report framework is. And this year we work to standardize that across all of the regional planning commissions. So regardless of which region you're in, if you pick up those assessments, you'll see them follow the same basic trend of looking at what we know today about our conditions and trends, looking to the future, really honing in on opportunities and barriers, thinking about how we can meet these local housing needs instead of just identifying them, and then drawing it all together and attaching some appendices that provide a quite a bit more technical information on where this information came from. So I'm gonna keep going a little bit here and we'll dig a little bit into the things we know, right? What we've seen in our existing conditions. So oftentimes when we do this, we look backwards a little bit to see what's happening now and get a bit of a trend. And the first place to start really on housing is to think about our populations. It's interesting on the slide, we can certainly see that the, the busiest period of growth and population in the state has been actually back in the seven, sorry, the, from 1970 to 1990. And during this time, we saw about 180,000 people join our state within that each one of those decades. More recently, you can see that trend taper off a bit. And Leading into 2020, we saw about a third of that rate of growth with 61,000 new residents joining us. The experience has been somewhat similar in places across the state, but there's certainly a good amount of regional variation. So across the whole state, we saw pretty strong growth through the 1990s. This you can see specifically, that's kind of this first bar in this, these tables. The difference, the only sort of outlier here is Coas County, where in that period of time, we actually saw a population decline, which tied into some pretty um, large changes in employment that were happening and issues going on in Coas County. But then as we look forward, we see that in 2000s, that rate of population growth from the 90s really drops off in almost all of our counties. The exceptions here are sort of Sullivan and Stratford County, where we saw a bit of a continued growth in that rate of population change. Looking toward the more recent years, we certainly see that number either level off or start to decline a bit. So it really makes the case that across all of our regions, growth has been stronger in the past and it's tapered off a bit now, a little bit of variation in there, but certainly something we see changing across the whole state. Oh, no, no you're muted. You're muted. You know, you'd think I'd remember that today. Um, looking forward now, um, 
Uh, my office, OPD, commissioned um, population projections um, that were completed by RLS demographics um, to support both the regional housing needs assessment and state, ho state housing needs assessment projects through 2050. Um, and what we found is that uh, the population uh, in the North Country and Southwest regions are expected to remain flat, um, uh, but, you know, kind of following, as Kayla was saying, kind of the historic trends, but the greatest increase um, in projected population increases um, as high as 13.4%, uh, um, I believe, in the uh, Stratford region, um, and, you know, at least greater than 10% in other part, in other uh, regions, all in the southeastern part of the state, which have historically had the highest population um, levels of the state and also have some of the higher levels of density in the state. So on a statewide basis, um, what that means is that uh, population growth is expected to continue growing. Uh, we're expected to grow a little bit under from 2020 to 2030, um, a little bit under um, 100,000 new people. Um, and then the population will uh, level off um, around uh, 2040 with a high of roughly 1.51 million people and then start to decline um, after that. Um, and the reason for that, as the next slide um, shows, is that um, the sorry, is that um, the um, there's just gonna we're just gonna keep seeing a significant increase um, in the number of, or the death rate, uh, and this is primarily due to the fact that. Um, the baby boomer generation is going to continue aging over the next two decades um, and will have largely kind of exited stage right by 2040. So that by 2040, um, as you see in green here, um, I don't know if my cursor is showing up or not, 28% uh, of the state's residents will be age 65 plus compared to only 19% uh, in 2020. Um, and um, these challenges uh, with or with a kind of relatively level um, birth rate and net migration rate, um, these challenges are going to create uh, it's going to create difficulty in maintaining economic growth. Um, and so, without a significant change uh, in migration patterns or birth rate, um, you know, it's going to be hard to kind of change that population trajectory. I guess this table also shows that it. Um, we're going to need more housing options for the aging population for seniors, especially those hoping to age in place um, who could face a shortage of supportive and health care services. So as kind of I alluded to in that prior slide, um, again, this this slide just kind of does a, another kind of breakdown of kind of the change in the um, the age cohorting and the age demographics. So um, right now there's a or in 2010 there was a uh, roughly similar um, amount of people between the age 55 to 64 and 65 and over uh, age cohorts um, with um, still made up close to 160,000 uh, people. Um, but then you see this kind of divergence um, from 2020, and then you see this kind of continual rise of um, the 65 plus population to 2040 before it starts to kind of level off a little, like I said, once the baby boomer generation has kind of exited, exited stage right. Meanwhile, um, the uh, 20 to 34 population, the 34 to 54, and the 55 and the uh, under 20 populations, they're all kind of, there's a little bit ebb and flow, but they're they're largely um, relatively flat or static, or in some cases even declining. Um, again, this is, we'll get into a minute, it's just, uh, has can have a significant impact on the type of housing we need. So from a household size perspective, um, Household size has also decreased uh, average median household size. So from 2020 to from 2010 to 2020, throughout the state, um, we saw a decline in the average um, population size from, um, you know, 2.5 to uh, we're getting going closer and closer down to two, um, and that is um, that's what that means is that. Um, 
smaller household size means that we need more units to house those households. Um, now, this pattern isn't totally unique across the state. Um, the um, most of the regions, most of the RPC regions, have kind of seen a similar decrease in household size. However, the Upper Valley, like Sunapee Regional Planning Commission region, which encompasses, among other communities, the Lebanon Hanover area, which has a high uh, population of uh, students, uh, doctors, what have you, uh, they've actually seen um, an increase in the uh, average household size. Um, this could be again, because of the higher percentage of students, potentially in roommate situations, the kind of um, people, new families moving up there, the kind of attractiveness of that region, some of the communities in that region. Um, but largely speaking, um, the smaller household size is driven by the fact that families are having fewer children. Um, and there's also just more uh, household formation is changing. There's more single parents uh, and we're becoming an older state as well. So coupled with that is the fact that um, with declining household sizes um, comes, not surprisingly, a decline in school enrollments. Smaller household sizes, families are having less kids, means that there's less kids in school. So from 2013 to 2021, as the slide shows, uh, school enrollments actually fell approximately 10% statewide. Um, that was a drop of approximately 17,300 students. Um, the largest numerical declines, um, as you can see in this slide, um, in the light green for the Southern New Hampshire Planning Commission region, the um, kind of maroonish, I'm sorry, uh, yes, the orangish color uh, for the Rockingham Planning Commission region, and the um, maroonish color for the National Regional Planning Commission. Um, so some of the largest declines um, in school enrollment during these times. Um, and then um, on a numerical basis, on a percentage basis, the Rockingham Planning Commission, National Regional Planning Commission in the North Country, um, North Country Council region also saw a uh, percentage declines greater than the state average. Um, I don't think we have school enrollment projection data um, here that was part of the study, um, but um, Unless somebody knows something I don't know, um, I think um, the school, these kind of general decline in school enrollment trends are probably expected to continue. Um, and then again, looking at the income side of um, the kind of breakdown of income characteristics, um, there's been a significant um, shift in the income distribution statewide from 2020 to 20 from 2010 to 2020. Um, there have been specifically we've seen as a result of in migration, um, especially from some of our southern states um, and even from other parts of the country and internationally migration of higher income households um, that shifted the overall state's income distribution upwards. Specifically, um, we've seen a large shift in the um, households earning over a hundred thousand dollars of income it's actually a 12 percent increase um in that um group from 26 percent to 38 percent between 2010 and 2020 and that's been um kind of mirrored or coupled with a eight percent decline uh in households earning um under fifty thousand dollars represented here in the um bottom two bars of the kind of light blue and the um, aqua color um, kind of bars here on the left. Um, again, there's some fluctuation here across the regions and counties here. We're looking at the region this county variation. Um, again, not surprisingly, uh, New Hampshire's North Country and Southwestern communities. So the so Coas County here, as well as um, Cheshire and Sullivan counties have the highest share of lower income residents, while the seacoast in southern New Hampshire, so Rockingham County, Stratford County, and um, Hillsborough County, um, which include, uh, tend to have higher uh, incomes, um, with Manchester and Nashua uh, being kind of the exceptions to that, um, both within Hillsborough County, which has some very low income, some of the most low income census tracts in the whole state. 
So again, there that points out just, you know, while the Hillsborough County is relatively affluent, we don't want to forget that they also have some very, very low income areas um, that we need to pay attention to as well. From a building permit um, perspective of how are we doing building? Um, so if we were to extend this chart showing housing units permitted from 1980 uh, through, two, through 2021, um, we'd see that um, even here you can see uh, housing units, although they were a little lower in 1980. Um, in the um, 70s, um, and then again in the mid 80s, um, the state reached a peak of over 18,000 building permits in 1986. Um, since then, um, that number has dropped off uh, significantly. Um, this was partly during the, uh, you know, the crash here in the late uh, in what the late 80s and then the savings and loan crisis then there started to be a somewhat of a rebound um, during the dot-com era from the late 90s into the early 2000s um, and the tech boom the initial kind of tech boom but then after the um, uh, the housing uh, bubble uh, and the great recession in the 2005 or 2006 ish then the number kind of started to level off again um, and we actually got to a low of uh, in 2012 um, of uh, under or close to just over, I believe in the 3000 uh, unit range. We've since started to recover a little bit. And so other than some um, dip in 2017 and then in 2020 during the pandemic, the numbers have started to increase again to uh, last year, 2021, the most recent year that OPD has collected building permit data from the state permitted just under 5,000 units. But again, as we'll get into a little bit later, um, this does not come anywhere close to meeting need. Uh, and it is still, in general terms, we are still permitting and producing um, housing units um, at recessionary levels, even though Except for about, you know, barring the last kind of year or so of kind of the great inflation of still being in a general very long term kind of period of economic growth. Now I'm going to turn it back to my to uh, Kayla. So looking actually at the slide Noah was just having, I think it was pretty clear to see that even along the way, the units that are permanent are mostly single family homes. So I'm going to take that and run with it and look a little bit at our housing characteristics in terms of the types of housing we produce. And the charts here really show, frankly, that things are largely unchanged, right? Since 2010 and then in 2020, the vast majority of our homes in the state are single family detached homes. If you also loop into those single family attached homes, which are like townhouses or condominiums, that takes up the vast majority of our housing stock. And there's a couple of things that this really means for us. Um, specifically, single family homes tend to be our most expensive home housing type. So when we think about meeting the needs of our diverse households in the state, we know that we need to have more options for choice for folks who have lower incomes and to meet the needs and demands of folks, particularly as they start to age, right? We need to start looking at some out of the box solutions for us, a little less single family homes and a little more other types. A benefit of that is that more varied housing types are going to help us provide better opportunities for low income households in the state. And like I said, aging seniors, particularly too, when we look at things like social isolation. So zooming in a little bit on some of our specific housing needs, right? We end up seeing this slide here is looking at the density of our housing units. So how many housing units there are in what sort of areas. And what we end up knowing is that low to moderate income households are much more likely to occupy moderate density multifamily housing. So that means things basically housing types that have five to 49 unit buildings. They're also more likely to occupy manufactured homes. And we also see that there's a correlation between low and moderate income and households that have a disability households without children, and single parent households. So they're more likely to live in these housing types that have at least moderate density to them. So when we think about meeting the needs of our diverse and changing population, it's important for us to start to look at how we provide more of those housing types that are within reach of folks. 
In the Stratford region, we see UNH, Dover, Rochester, Summersworth, they're driving the diversity of mix far more than other parts of the state with a larger share of these multifamily structures. Looking north, up in my neck of the woods, we see Coas County where most of the housing that seems to be within affordable reach is in manufactured housing. As would be expected, the highest density or concentrations of housing can still be found in southeastern New Hampshire and along the 93 corridor north of Manchester. So one specific thing, I this this is a slide of mine that I use up in the North Country that we jammed in here. So looking specifically at the North Country, we see that we're producing a very, very slow rate of units. And as Noah pointed out, that is not different from the statewide traditions, but we have tried to look at in our regional assessment what that is looking like in terms of our share of multifamily versus single family housing. And I think that chart in the bottom right there with units and structures really tells the story pretty well of what we're seeing. It is as time goes on, we're continuing to see ourselves grow more and more in our single family detached structures. And that is probably a direction that we need to start evaluating a little more critically to see where we can provide opportunities for different types of housing to show up. I think I'm going to head it back, hand it back to Heather now. Thank you, Kayla. Um, so this slide here, we're looking at um, the availability of homes for sale. This is um, what we call months to absorb inventory, which is a metric we use to quantify the relationship between supply and demand in the housing market. Um, so if we didn't add any new listings, how long would it currently take to sell off inventory? And we've been um, kind of hovering around one month, a little less than one month um, for quite some time now. Um, to put this into context, we consider six months um, a healthy market balancing the interests of both buyers and sellers. Um, and so if we compare January of 2020 to January of 2022, there has been 72% less inventory available for purchase. And so this allows for less choice. It increases demand and also home prices, which we'll see in some later slides. On the the oops on the rental oh, on the rental side, um, we're we're looking here at at vacancy rates, and so this is based on New Hampshire Housing's annual rental rental cost survey. Um, and so essentially, what this shows is rental units are really hard to find anywhere in New Hampshire. Um, we consider 5% a balanced market um, in the rental world and 3% we consider turnover. So um, essentially just the time it takes to prep a unit for the next tenant to maybe paint the walls, change the carpets out. But we haven't been around that 5% range in about 12 years. And so that's really good news if um, you own properties and are renting them out. Um, but it's really challenging if you are looking to rent in New Hampshire. Um, so for statewide overall, um, this is kind of the county breakout we can see here. Statewide overall, we're at a 0.3% vacancy rate for two-bedroom units and a 0.5% vacancy rate for all units. Um, and so essentially, it's not so much about finding a unit you can afford anymore. I think the top priority is just finding a unit, period. Um, and it's very challenging. Um, so this the impact of this is no little to no choice for renters um, and it impacts renters having the opportunity to move into home ownership as well because um, again we'll see the supply and demand issue really has an impact on um, costs and prices so here we're looking at um, housing market trends um, home ownership rates uh, have declined uh, for all age groups. And so, uh, except for 15 to 24 years old uh, and for age 65 and older. 
um, the 15 to 24 um, grouping um, we concluded could be a margin of error. It's a very small sampling size, so um, that's likely what that is there. There's there's probably a pretty high margin of error. Um, they're also they're far less homeowners with incomes from 25,000 to 100,000 in 2020 when we compare that to 2010. Um, so again, I think. Overall, the housing market is becoming more challenging. Um, as Kayla showed in previous slides, um, we are a big state with uh, single family homes and a lot of people aspire to be a homeowner. And um, I think these figures just show that it's harder for people to cross over from rental into homeownership. Uh, this is looking at the purchase price trend. So we talked about um, for sale inventory and how that has been declining. Um, but what that really does is put pressure on the prices in the purchase market. And so um, in March of 2023, we had a median sales price of four hundred and forty thousand um, dollars. March of 2021 we were at 340,000 um, but when we compare that to March of 2020 we've seen a 44% increase in price um you can see starting in 2020 we saw quite an acceleration of price increases in June of 2022 we saw a record high median sales price of $450,000 um so between the year 2000 and 2020, New Hampshire home values rose by 111%, uh, but median household income only rose by 73%. And so we're seeing this um, rapid acceleration of home values and prices, and it's not keeping pace with the incomes um, in New Hampshire. And so again, that really creates challenge for those looking to um, cross over from being a, a renter into home ownership. Um, there's also, uh, a lot less on the market to choose from. Um, and so it's just overall uh, really challenging. We and then a not, I'm sorry to interrupt, Heather. We do have a question is, what is the mini variation seasonal on purchase price trends from Eric? Um, so there's always been this cyclical um, real estate for purchase cycle that we would see and typically things would peak in the summer and then they would slow down in the winter months. Um, what happened during COVID is we didn't see that. So in 2020, um, we didn't really see the seasonality uh, impact the prices and inventory and things just continue taking off. We're starting to go back into, we're starting to see things kind of ease back into those normal cycles um where prices tend to be higher in the summer months and then they tend to to be lower in the winter months and that's kind of like a, a demand um issue a lot of buyers or potential buyers tend to come out in those summer months to purchase and so um i think does that answer the question noah yes i believe so thank you um when looking at uh kind of home prices and the increase we've seen in, in the past few years, a, another really big element to affordability and what's going on in the market is the interest rates. And so here uh, we're showing interest and principal payments based on a $400,000 home purchased with 5% um, down on a 30 year mortgage. And so these figures do not include insurance insurances and taxes, um, but the average, a uh, 30 year fixed rate mortgage um, currently is around six and a half percent. It's been kind of hovering around there. Um, in December of 2020, we saw the lowest rate ever recorded at 2.68 percent. And so people who have been trying to find a home, feel like they're ready for a home, could have started looking for a home back in 2020. And with the low inventory and the high prices, it, it can take people years uh, in this current market to find a place. And so an added challenge to that for people currently looking or people just trying to save up to to cross that, cross that uh, threshold from renter to ownership, uh, this interest rate change uh, is a really big challenge because a two-year difference um, from 2020 to uh, 2022, we saw um, uh, 
a difference that could increase the cost almost a thousand dollars a month for the buyer. And so if you're in the market currently looking and you're not finding anything over time as interest rates climb, this is an added challenge. It's also an added challenge for people that are trying to figure out what they can afford in the market um, now at a higher interest rate. And then looking at uh, th this again, our uh, median gross incomes from our annual resi residential rental cost survey that New Hampshire Housing does every year. Um, so the median gross rent, which includes rent, contract rent, and utilities, um, but the median gross rent for a two-bedroom unit um, shown from last year's 2022 survey was almost $1,600 a month. And for all units combined, it was right over $1,500 a month. Um, and we can see the trends over time. We've seen significant changes um, between 2021 and 2022, um, a 6 to 10% increase in gross rents. Um, and over the past five years, we've seen 26 to 32% increases. So we've had a pretty strong economy, as Noah had said, um, you know, in the past few years, low unemployment, and that puts pressure on the market. Um, you know, trying to find workers to come and fill job positions puts pressure on the rental market, um, low vacancy rates, and that increases um, the price that uh, property owners can charge for their for their rental units. Excuse me. Here we're looking at um, kind of like a gap analysis from the statewide housing needs assessment, um, and this. This compares the proportions of renters at area median income levels with the availability of affordable homes to buy between 2010 and 2020. Um, the difference in proportion widened. Um, renters with less than 120% AMI are, are less competitive in the home buying market. Although the number of low income renters have declined, the, the drop in affordable rentals is much greater. Um, the state's lowest income renters are um, unfortunately the ones that are most adversely affected by these price increases. They have fewer resources to manage rent increases. They have far fewer units to choose from and are just overall less competitive in the rental market. The rental gap increased by um, 2,415 units um, or more than 10% between 2010 and 2020. Um, and so, you know, we have higher income renters, um, renting units that they could probably afford more um, because there's just not units available for them. So they're kind of renting down, if you will. And then um, that puts pressure on the market. And then people that can afford um, less, there's not a lot for them. And so they have to pay more than they um, more than what's affordable for them in rental costs. And so what we're looking at here now is, is this is looking at the max affordable rent by occupation. And so um, this assumes spending in rental housing costs rep represents 30% of gross income, which is, is what we consider affordable housing costs. Um, and we, in this analysis, it was 2021 wages, um, which were adjusted for inflation to estimate 2022 wages. And so you'll see, um, it's really hard for a single person to afford um, a rental unit. So for childcare workers, which is the lowest bar here all the way to the left, um, what they could afford in rent is 629. And so as I've shown you in the previous slides, um, th they're not even coming close to what the median rental costs are in the state. And so that's a, re a really big challenge. And on the other end of that spectrum, the, the tallest bar there to the right, that's um, a, reg a registered nurse, um, and this is saying they can afford roughly uh, 2,097 in rent. Um, but all the occupations in between, we have you know uh, cashiers who can only afford 656 dollars uh, a month affordable for rental, and um, next to that is home health and personal care aides. And so it's really challenging for those people to find anything that they could afford in the state for rent rental units. 
And then if we switch over to the um, home price side, it's, it's the same kind of exercise here, maximum affordable home price by occupations, um, median annual wage. And in this um, exercise, it assumes spending in housing costs, uh, again, represent 30% of the gross income. Um, maximum affordable home price is based on a 30-year mortgage with 10% down payment and an interest rate of 5.5%, um, which is a little, probably a percentage point lower than kind of where we're at now. Um, property taxes and insurance, HOAs and utilities are assumed to collectively account for 40% of the monthly payment. Um, 2021 wages were adjusted for inflation, again, to estimate the 2022 wages. And, and you'll see, um, again, the people that are on the, the lower end here, um, roughly to the left of the slide, again, childcare workers, they could afford a home price of $76,209, um, probably not something that you will come across in the inventory shown in New Hampshire for a home. Um, going up to construction laborers, they can afford $122,000. That's going to be challenging for them to find a home at that price. Um, all the way up to, all the way to the right, a registered nurse. Um, could afford 243000 for a home. And again, just showing the median prices in the state, that, that still is going to be challenging to find a home for that, for that price, and that's affordable for that occupation. And now I think I will turn it over to Zach. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so as part of the housing needs assessment, we looked at communities of interest, which were populations that have, you know, um, additional uh, barriers to accessing housing compared to the general population. And we've touched on some of those, such as low income seniors, that sort of thing. Uh, here we have another example. We have uh, you know, uh, households with uh, by uh, uh, whether or not they have a vehicle available. Um, uh, within the uh, within the state, there are about 27,000 no vehicle households. And uh, over 44 census tracts have at least one or in 10 households with no vehicles. Uh, those without vehicles uh, are more frequently renters, as we can see here. Um, how, this can either be by choice or need to live near proximity to uh, transit or, or walkable neighborhoods. And this has housing policy implications in terms of if you have a household without vehicles, therefore, you know, parking is going to be less. There are challenges, though, because, you know, these are clearly a lot of times that uh, neighborhoods that are going to be more expensive than uh, your typical one. And this is also a particular challenge for rural communities uh, where these populations do exist, especially as they age. Then we also have persons with disabilities. 13% uh, of all New Hampshire residents have at least some form of a disability. And this has you know, various implications in terms of housing and perhaps a move towards age friendly housing, you know, universal design and things like smaller single story development, which is easier to age in place. Uh, 2021 ABLE New Hampshire surveys found that 70% of caretakers and individuals of, and with disability need access to supportive, accessible, affordable housing. In our state, that's about 47,000 people. Uh, caretakers in general are older. They're, you know, 60, you know, 60% are between 55 and 74. So they're clearly either taking care of an adult child or a spouse. And 50% uh, responded that they wanted to uh, desire to live independently. Another group that we haven't mentioned yet is veterans. Veterans face a number of barriers um, through whether it's you know uh, mental health or other issues, and it's statewide. You know, about 53% of the New Hampshire veteran population is 65 or older. That's not surprising given where we are and how long it's been since we've had a war where you had general conscription. Uh, 17,000 live in either low quality or unaffordable housing, and about 115 are currently uh, homeless as last reported. The, uh, sorry, I lost my slide. Across the state, uh, racial and Hispanic and Lat or Latin or Latino minority populations have grown over the last 20 years. In 2020, about 13%. New Hampshire's population was a racial or ethnic minority. That's pretty low uh, nationwide. The na national rate is 40%. or the fourth least diverse uh, state in the nation, uh, be just behind West Virginia and our neighbors, Maine and Vermont. 
However, there are you know populations where there there are neighborhoods where you have minority majority neighborhoods or near minority majority neighborhoods, and you can see that populations are largely concentrated you know, uh, throughout the Merrimack Valley and the seacoast. But we also do see it in you know uh, the Upper Valley and other college towns. Uh, and while minority populations have expanded in the state between 2010 and 2020, ownership rates have declined both for all for Hispanic, Black, and Asian households. And nationwide, Black ownership rates in the country are lower than they were during uh, pre-civil rights era. Uh, demonstration based on race is obviously illegal under the Fair Housing Act, but prosecuting cases can be actually very difficult to do. Did I, was I seeing the long, wrong slide there? We might have been looking at poverty, I think. Poverty, I'm sorry. Um, I have my notes here. Uh, so poverty, I'm going to go through poverty real quick here. Uh, lower incomes obviously, households obviously face uh, housing barriers. Federal programs um, exist to help finance the, and support those under 80% area median income. But that obviously doesn't go far enough. And a lot of these programs are uh, conditional on you know, the landlord being accepting a voucher or something of that kind. Just for reference, the 2022 federal poverty uh, threshold for a single person is uh, 65. Uh, under 65 is about 14 grand. Uh, poverty rates have declined across the region, with the exception of uh, Sullivan County, where they've ticked up a bit. Uh, again, high poverty rates are in places that you might expect, such as Manchester or Durham. You know, college students don't have a lot of money, uh, but there are also a lot here that we see in purple in the North Country and rural areas throughout the state. I or obviously I already said that, but just we're gonna talk through it real quick. Um, you can see here in the map that not only the population is growing over the last uh, 20 years, but we also see the concentrations in the Merrimack Valley on the sea coast and uh, through the upper valley. Another group, another uh, community of interest would be youth. So in this case, we're talking about minors, those less than 20, uh, less than 18 years old. And as we see in the public schools uh, play out that, we, you know, this is also obviously happening, just uh, reflected in general population. Over the past two decades, public school enrollment has fallen by 22 percent statewide. And what's that look like for a household? Well, we've also seen an example here calling out uh, my region, the Southern New Hampshire Planning Commission, but also the state region wide. Since 1980, there's been a you know, wide decline um, in the number of minors per household, and statewide it's fallen by about 43 percent. In some towns, it's uh, even higher. Candy in my region, it's a uh, it's over 50 percent. So that's what we're seeing in terms of just the smaller households and fewer children per household. Another. A, uh, another group uh, that we're going to talk about is uh, is a uh, group quarters. So these are people who are not living in households. So whether it's a, a prison, a uh, nursing home, um, foster care, or something like that, where they uh, uh, are living not you know, obviously in, in a, a typical household. The uh, this the, the chart on the left does not include um, um, uh, college dorms, I believe. And we've seen that it's not really changed that much over the last 20 years, uh, which is a bit surprising given just that we know that, you know, uh, you know, our population is aging. So you would expect, uh, you know, nursing homes to grow and that sort of thing. So was, that has real implications in terms of uh, planning for alternative care and caregivers. Um, the low growth we have seen seems to have been in corrections and non-institutional uh, populations. The uh, another big implication of this is these are for most group quarter populations, with the exception of you know, those in nursing homes. These are populations that are one day going to leave the group quarters and you know, re-enter society in a non-group uh, you know, quarter living situation. And in, in general, we have very little information on who they are and where they go, and how that in general that just fits uh, with the overall housing uh, question. The homeless uh, homelessness throughout the state is. Uh, you can see that about uh, about a 
Most are single adults, but also a quarter are families with children, and only about 11% are what chronically chronically homeless. The uh, the distribution throughout the state is yeah, there's a there's a much higher concentration in Manchester and Nashua, um, much higher than you would expect based on their overall population. But about half of the you know, overall homeless population lives in you know, another municipality, whether it's a small town or a small city. And we have to keep that in mind as well. Population has increased um, some over the last, you know, let's say, eight years. Uh, you know, peaked during the first first bit of 2020, and then fell then, and is again again now increasing. So I'm going to grab it now and talk a little bit about the things we are a little less clear on, some of the new trends and things that are impacting things. We've been spending a bit of time talking about what we know and the places where we can look back to see what the trends are and project out what might be considerations we need for the future. But we wanted to take a second to just touch on some of the things that are a little less predictable or that are changing quite a bit more recently. Um, I think it surprises no one to say that the COVID-19 pandemic has changed where people are living, how they're living, where they're working, and that has had pretty big impacts on housing. And we're very keen to see what continues to play out on that. That's a very new trend. Um, climate change is also something that has a lot of implications for us in housing, and there's kind of two faces to that. One of those is that New Hampshire and New England as a whole is a relatively safe place. We have access to drinking water. It is a pretty mild environment aside from those rough winter days. But because of that, it's a place that can be a little bit of a potentially a climate change draw, right? We can see some pretty big changes potentially in what we see in migration patterns to the state in the future that may not have been reflected over the past decades because these changes are coming in their the speed of changes adjusting quite a bit recently. The other piece to climate change is that with more water, we also potentially have more structures that were built along our river beds and our river valleys and small towns and might have to actually look a little bit about the resilience of our structures a little bit more if we have more water in the area. So there's a couple of pieces to sort of watch on that in our housing stock about where it's being built, but also what those demands are. It could change quite a bit for us. Monetary policy, as Heather was talking about in interest rates, monetary policy, where those interest rates come from, relate back to pretty big decisions being made at the federal level. And those have large impacts on how far the dollars in people's pockets go towards affording housing. We also see construction costs changing a lot right now. And we saw some of that peak during COVID. We have seen some materials costs come down, but generally we have a pretty tight market for construction labor, and those costs tend to be generally quite a bit higher than they have been in the past. And that's another thing that is a new trend we really are watching to see where it's going to go. Short-term rentals are one that is starting to change things quite a bit as well. Um, honestly, it just adds another source of demand on our housing. And right now we see a lot of high demand for housing across the board. So any new characteristics adding to that could have a quite a bit of weight in places. In some of our college and university towns, we're seeing changes in enrollment and we're seeing changes in the number of people who are physically living in those communities, which has actually seen some pretty interesting pieces to look at in those host communities about the housing stock that's available, how occupied it is and who's there. Zooming in just a little bit on the North Country and the short term rentals topic, this is something that the North Country has a disproportionate share of short term rentals as compared to other parts of the state. Um, the Lakes region has a similar condition, but those are sort of our some of our tourism hubs in the state. And with that, we have seen notable growth in short term rentals in the northern portions of the state. We've also seen that the costs um, for housing go up quite a bit as short-term rental markets get more competitive. We generally see that the income a property owner can usually draw in from a monthly rental for a short-term rental 
on average is quite a bit higher per month than a long-term rental rate would be. And so that creates a pretty interesting position where folks who own rental properties right now have a much more lucrative way to earn money off of those properties. And it creates additional burdens for our renting households when they're trying to find access to units. So looking a bit to opportunities and barriers, right? Where we have places to address some of these challenges and where we have some barriers that might need to be removed to help us address the housing needs we see in the future. We see those fall into a handful of specific buckets. We know that land use regulations and policies and other controls that are in place locally have quite a bit of sway on the cost of housing, what's produced and what can come into communities and how much housing fits in a place. And those are things that we need to start looking at to find opportunities to increase more housing choice and to remove some of those barriers. We also see that workforce challenges and employment have quite a bit to do with this. As we've said before, wage growth is lagging behind our housing cost growth and employment is continually something that we're going to need to look at, right? We have thriving economies in New Hampshire that require a lot of people to run them. And as we see more and more people moving into retirement age, we need to look at how we can really have opportunities to keep our industries thriving by making sure there's places for folks to live and work in these positions. Another thing we look at is access to opportunity, which I'm going to talk more about on the next slide, but this is really looking at where are the places where people have the services and supports and opportunities to thrive in communities and where growth is really driven. Another piece is certainly physical infrastructure. Our roads, our wastewater systems, our transportation and transit systems, they all have a lot to do, particularly also, and I'm neglecting services, but things like healthcare. These all have a lot of sway on where people live and where they can live, how they can move around and meet their needs. So on this slide, I'm going to talk a little bit closer about those opportunity areas when I mentioned access to opportunity on the last slide. So opportunity areas, this is a really, I think this is a really interesting slide. I didn't make it and it's wonderful. So I'm going to give credit to somebody who did. Um, I'm lucky enough to get to talk about it. But opportunity areas are places where there are the chance for people to excel, right? And we look at that to say what sort of infrastructure is there, not just physical infrastructure, but what is the condition of people's education, of economic prosperity, of housing access, and of health? in figuring out where people really have the opportunity to make the best use of things and improve their lives and be really productive. Um, we look at this in a few ways, but when you look at across the board, we generally see that across all of New Hampshire's regional planning commissions, many of our communities have great high opportunity areas, which makes them magnets. They're wonderful places to draw development to. The North Country tends to lag behind this in, in a bit, and do, as do some corners of the Southwest. But overall, there are great opportunity areas that we can use to see one, how to create more opportunity in some places, but also it can help us see where there are really great opportunities for folks to improve their livelihoods as they become part of these communities. I think I'll hand it back to Zach now. Thanks. Uh, talking there, we have, as you were mentioning there, talking about you know where services are, where infrastructure is. I think it's important that we step back and think about you know, if, when we talk about housing solutions, you know, they need to be contingent on where people are and where services are. And, you know, um, one thing I often hear a lot is that New Hampshire is a rural state. And that's true if you think of New Hampshire as the land. But if you think of it as the people, it's more complicated than that. So on the left there, you have our, the four, uh, the six New England states and the percentage of each uh, state that lives in an urban area. And you can see that Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island, you all have about 90% uh, living in an urban area. And then Ver Maine and Vermont is about 35 to 40. And then New Hampshire is about 58, so three and five. And that's kind of unusual because we're uh, you know, kind of in between. So we're not a 
we're not a totally urban state, you know, although in, you know, a majority do live in an urban area, but we're also not a rural state. And so we need to think of solutions that, you know, consider that. As uh, Kayla was talking about, we have infrastructure here and uh, we see the concentration of infrastructure typically where the concentration of population is. And we need to consider housing and transportation together. Um, you know, for example, housing might be cheaper in a more rural or exurban community, but if it takes the person you know, an hour to commute and that you know, drives up their commuting costs, that might eat into the actual savings that they get from the housing. Um, so and we need to plan housing along economic growth and transportation systems. Uh, water and sewer availability is also a big impact on whether you know housing can be built and how much how dense it can be. You know it seems to be concentrated throughout the Merrimack Valley and the seacoast. But you know if you look at the map, there's basically systems throughout the state, even in you know far north of uh, the state. An example I talked about, you know, housing and uh, transportation interacting with each other. Here's a map of Manchester, and the one on the left is the black is showing all the parcels that were developed between 19 before 1960, and the red is the former streetcar network. If you don't know, Manchester had a streetcar network that was taken out, you know, mid-century, um, and so we can definitely see how those two uh, interplay. And then on the right, we have the uh, black is again everything that was developed, but this time after 1960. And the, the red there is the limited access highway system. You know, so clearly there, you know, with these two different sectors that we think of as separate have a you know deep interplay with each other. And that has implications. So here is an example of every this is everything within one mile of downtown Manchester. Everything red is a per off street perfect off street uh, parking facility. So this does not include on street parking. Uh, there are 828 acres reserved for off street parking in driveways within a mile of a uh, downtown. And that's value, that's land that would be valued at around 250 million or 8% of the city's total land value and could provide uh, housing for about 4,400 housing units that would still be in line with the current uh, housing density of the area. Here's another. Uh, uh, sector to consider how does housing and land use have implications for equity and justice on then we are this analysis that is not unique to Manchester but we're able to do it in Manchester because the data is granular enough that we can actually see the uh, the effects so the map on the left is just a map of uh, the percentage by zoning district that is a racial or ethnic minority so red would be you know um, you know having more diverse lighter lighter red you know pink would be less diverse. And then on the right is just that green lines are all the areas that are single family owned zoning. And there's obviously a very high correlation and concentration of minorities then in areas that are not single family zones. And, and you need to think about, you know, uh, you know uh, housing and costs. Uh, this is um, a graph that shows just this SNHP region, but if we did throughout the state, we'd see the same implications. And what this is showing is just the average value of a, of a property by its overall acreage. And in the SNHPC re region, the average single family home on one acre costs twice as much as the home on a tenth of an acre. And you can also see that most of that growth happens between, you know, you know, a tenth of an acre and, you know, two and a half, three acres. And then once you get out beyond that, it's, you know, you don't really see that increase anymore. So it's within that, you know, you know, you know postage stamp lot, two and a half acres that we see this real increase in price. Also as implications for municipal finances, you know, the, uh, the, the, ha the, val the value varies a lot. The value per acre varies a lot based on the art parcel size. Uh, when we're gonna use the example for dairy, Dairy is a, a on in dairy, the typical single family home on a tenth of an acre is worth 80 grand less than in the typical home on one acre, but generates more than 12 times as much gross revenue to, for the town per area. And so when you add density, you greatly increase the overall property value for that is generated for the town. Now, clearly, this doesn't consider services, uh, and services obviously do increase as you increase density. But we have about now, you know, 
75 years worth of studies that consistently show that as you over time, as you increase density, the, uh, the value that is created from that will outpace the costs and the services that need to be provided. And we also have some weird uh, funky stuff going on with you know, the way we have our current tax system set up and assessing this done. So this is a, a chart, I'm sorry, a graph that's showing the land value per acre for single family homes as a percentage of that for two acre homes. And these are for all the 10,000 person residents or more communities in my region. And if the uh, what happens here is that smaller parcels pay a higher tax rate per acre than larger parcels. That is, the bigger the property you have, the less taxes you pay. Uh, think of it is is you know the more money you made in income, you know your your marginal tax rate declined all over time, which is obviously not how most taxes work and how we want things to function. And we can see this in an example here from uh, just uh, just two properties that I picked largely at random from a municipality in my region. Uh, these are two single family homes. One is the one on the left is on a tenth of an acre. And the one on the right is on a whole acre. They were, you know, the one left was built in 1990. Excuse me, 1900, and the one in uh, the right was built in 2004, just before the housing collapse. They, uh, you know, they both have water and sewer service. They both have city, you know, uh, city roads running to them. But yeah, you know, the one on the uh, the one on the left is 365 feet from a Fed Fed Aid eligible road, while the other, on the one on the right, is 1.12 miles. And you know, so that's the distance that you have to run that water and sewer. Uh, the property value on the one for the right, is, uh, excuse me, on the left, is about three hundred grand. Uh, the one on the right is about five hundred grand. So it is obviously significantly more. But the value per acre for the one on the left is three point four million. Uh, the value for the one on the right per acre is about three hundred forty thousand per acre. And I believe I'm going to pass this back. Okay, so um, the big question, how, how many units uh, do we need? And so uh, today it, we need over 23,000 units to stabilize the housing supply. Um, and so that equates to um, a little over 12,000 owner units and almost 11,000 rental units in the state. Um, but looking at the number of households that will be added based on population projections, um, which we talked about earlier. So taking those population projections then gives us the total number of units that will be needed over time. And so the figure on the left, the little house on the left, shows the numbers of units needed between 2020 and 2030. And then on the right hand side is um, the units needed between 2020 and 2040 to accommodate household growth and achieve and maintain a, a healthier housing market. And so the assumption behind these estimates is that added supply gets the state to a 5% rental vacancy rate and a 2% owner vacancy rate. And so to make up for the current deficit of units um, in the state of New Hampshire and to sustain a healthy market, the total production of new units needed by 2030 um, is almost 60,000 units. And that includes over 40,000 owner units and almost 20,000 rental units. And then by 2040, collectively, uh, we need almost 88,400 units, um, which includes 53,000 owner occupied and nearly 30,000 rental units. Now, the previous figures that I just spoke to do not account for demand for seasonal residents and second homes and must be incorporated into um, housing production planning. So um, to plan for this demand, the state would need an additional 13,000 to 23,000 units by 2040. And so looking at the units um, that we need to add between 2020 and 2030 and 2030 and 2040 um, in the light blue on the right hand side, when comparing it to historical production levels in the, in the dark blue on the left hand side, um, we can see that the production needed between 2020 and 2030 um, closely resembles the production that we produced in the year 2000 to 2010. Um, and then as population um, growth slows down and, um, and uh, you know, the older generation um, is kind of exiting out, uh, 
the housing units needed between 2030 and 2040 is, is much less and, and closer to what we saw in 2010 and 2020. However, you know, as we fail, if we fail to meet the demand of supply in 2020 and 2030, that's going to have a ripple effect on the house, housing units we're going to need to produce between 2030 and 2040. So I'm going to talk a little bit. I realize we only have about five minutes left, so I'll try to get through these last couple of slides rather quickly. Um, but so taking what Heather just looked at about kind of projecting um, where we're going forward versus historical permitting, um, while as Heather just showed, while the numbers of how many units we need are rather big going forward, um, they're not unreasonable. We've accommodated that, that demand before, and we can certainly uh, do it again. Um, as Heather noted, between 2000 and 2010, New Hampshire issued almost 60,000 uh, building permits, and by census counts, we added 68,000 new housing units during this time. This is actually very similar to the number of units, as Heather showed, that's what's needed um, to accommodate the need between now and 2030 when accounting for household growth, employment growth, a healthy level of vacancies, plus additional seasonal homes. Um, but I do want to bring attention also to the fact that um, some communities, in order to meet those levels, while statewide it's achievable, some regions of the state are going to need to see significant um, boosts in their levels of permitting when you compare their last five years, so 2016 to 2020, to what they would need just uh, between 2020 and 2025. So specifically, um, the um, central New Hampshire uh, region in and around Concord, um, would need to see the most significant increase in permitting to meet the 2025 projections of 233 percent. Um, in the um, Nashua, I'm sorry, the Southern New Hampshire Planning Commission region in and around Manchester would need to see a 219 uh, percent increase in permitting. Um, however, there's some communities that are actually, or some regions, I should say, um, that would actually need to see a significantly less boost in permitting. Um, to uh, meet at least the 2025 um, projections. I haven't done this analysis further out, but I think it's probably relatively similar. For example, the Stratford region, due in part to the fact that they have some communities like Dover, Rochester, and Summersworth, some higher density communities that have really kind of done, taken some steps to loosen their regulations, they only would need to increase their permitting by 112% uh, in the next five years to meet the projections. Um, and I just, I'm gonna tie this to a question <coughs> In the chat from um, Eric, I'm sorry, from um, Dave from a couple minutes ago, did the study consider the decline in construction related to decline in easily developable land in municipalities that have diminishing inventory of vacant parcels of land? So certainly um, there's definitely um, a shortage of easily developable land that doesn't have a lot of environmental constraints. I think we know that. That's a fact uh, in some areas. However, I would also say that um, the contention, you know, I think a lot of communities or some communities will maintain that they're fully built out based on their current zoning, which Zach started to kind of get into a little. That's really, um, there's, there really is, if you look at it statewide, there's plenty of land to develop um, more housing to meet these projections. A lot of it has to do with the constraints that, that we, the communities um, have placed and land use restrictions and zoning that they've placed um, on how that land can be used. So I'm not going to go through the fair share model in detail, um, other than to say that um, in addition to the regional lot, uh, ride, or we'll get into the projections in a minute, but we projected as part of um, the regional housing needs assessment project, root policy research helped us project not only took the state level projections that Heather showed um, a minute ago, um, and then um, brought those down to both the regional and um, municipal levels um, by looking at, in addition to, we modeled both the household growth and how many units are needed by household growth, and we um, married that or took 50% of that and also looked at 50% um, um, growth based on employees needed in each labor market area um, due to the fact that um, trying to kind of keep that relationship of where labor market areas basically um, are regionally mapped by kind of commuting patterns of where people live and where they work. Um, and so after kind of doing that first step of new of creating of 50% uh, households, 50% um, employees and labor market areas, um, we then um, looked at kind of um, did some kind of looked at 
for each labor market area and each community within a labor market area, how many uh, housing units uh, would be needed um, based on in our communities kind of permitting the amount of housing relative to the rest of the labor market area. We did some kind of rebalancing, whatever. And then finally, the final step was kind of looking at how many units are needed, both broken up by renters versus owners, above and below 60% of AMI uh, for renters and above and below 100% of AMI for owners. Um, that speaks to the uh, workforce, the um, Workforce Housing State Statutes definition. I will note that while we call this a fair share model and fair share is mentioned in the statute, uh, due to data constraints, we were not able to um, kind of project or come up with a current need level uh, for each municipality. And so we've kind of saying that these are really good for kind of planning and where communities could think about kind of going forward. However, um, the numbers are not to be, should not be used um, for actual for a community trying to determine if they're actually in compliance with the workforce housing statute or not. Um, so finally, like I said, um, the model presents uh, cumulative housing production targets as Heather got into at the state level and then down to the regional and municipal levels um, for 2025, 2030, 2035, and 2040. For example, uh, housing production targets for 2040, as Zach alluded to a second ago, so those are cumulative. So they include all the need number of units needed in um, 2025, 2030, and 2035. Um, and what you're going to see um, is that there's really a need throughout every region, need for a significant number of units uh, throughout every region. Um, Again, as I think we alluded to earlier, um, the southeastern part of the state, uh, so mostly primarily consisting of covered by the National Regional Planning Commission and RPC, uh, the Rockingham Planning Commission, RPC on this uh, table, and the Southern New Hampshire Planning Commission, SNHPC, they um, largely have the large, they have the highest um, number of units needed due to having historically the highest kind of population levels, and we don't see that trend changing. Um, however, um, you know, those numbers are big. The numbers for, you know, KO, KO for your region, for even though the numbers are a lot smaller, um, there's been a lot less historically, a lot less units built up there. And so those lower level of units of 1,782 units by 2025 or 3,209 units needed by 2030, you know, there's that's 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 a lot of units for the North Country to actually build. Um, so um, going forward, um, I think we already touched that. Uh, this is going to skip that in the interest of time. We did look at kind of adjusting the fair share numbers uh, based on a couple of other variables. Um, and then the next last two or three slides are just about the New Hampshire Housing Toolbox. Um, that's actually what the next session is about. So I'm not going to spend time right now going into the New Hampshire Housing Toolbox. Um, all I'll say is that um, it was part of the Regional Housing Needs Assessment Project. Um, it's a, a toolbox right now, a guide of 20 planning and zoning strategies for communities to con New Hampshire communities to consider to incentivize housing pr production. Um, and then, um, and you'll see it's categorized by what is the tool, how can it help, getting started, things to keep in mind, case studies relevant state laws and other resources. Uh, the presenters for the next session are going to go through that in much greater detail. Finally, um, these are the list of all the tools. I'm not going to go through this right now. I know we're going to go into a, some of the, a few of the tools in detail in the next session. Um, we are over um, at two o'clock. I know it was going to be a lot of slides to get through in an hour. Um, I know some people have put some questions and comments in the chat. Again, you can. We'll go a couple more minutes um, since the next session doesn't start till two fifteen. Um, so again, feel free to put a question uh, in the chat uh, or comment. Um, and we'll take a couple more minutes to go through that right now. Um, and then here's the contact information for all of our speakers. Um, sorry, let me go back to the Q&A for a minute. So, just want to make sure we're not missing anything. So Eric asked, with respect to increased services, it seems like the rapidly increasing public education spending with declining enrollments leading to rising property taxes, and significant housing affordability challenge. Um, I think that's a question, um, and I don't know if anybody wants to take that. I think that I did see that report recently as well. Um, 
Haley, you unmuted yourself, so I don't know if you want to try to attempt to answer that. I, I'm going to, and I'm going to first say that school costs and school enrollments have so many different variables that go into them. But one thing that I think it's important to look at is that a lot of school and educational costs are fixed costs. The buildings are expensive, they're large, they're expensive to heat. Bus routes are the same regardless of whether there are 12 kids on that route or 50. And so sometimes it's interesting to think about school enrollment and costs and what that's going to do. But really, I think when it comes to housing policy, it's important to think about what it is to have very fixed costs in a system and then a declining share of families who are sharing the cost of that burden. And I think it's important to sort of just look at it community by community. Sometimes you're seeing increased per pupil spending go up, but it's really because that declining enrollment is carrying a bigger share of some fixed costs. So I think more than anything, it's important to zoom into this really locally to see what is happening, but to not necessarily sort of tie the costs of students in your school to increase costs overall each time. I think it's something that kind of has to be looked at in a pretty nuanced way in places. Great. Thank you, Kayla. Um, and, and I just wanted to go back to a comment that I think was really important that uh, Honorable Representative Susan Almy from uh, Lebanon pointed out, if I can find this again, somewhere up here in the chat. Um, because the cost of housing in areas like the Upper Valley, um, low income people could not find an apartment cheap enough to meet the HUD rent ceiling that also meets HUD quality inspections. Um, I think Representative Almi, Almi is speaking to the fact of um, HUD fair market rents um, and the type of units um, that vouchers would qualify for. They'd have to meet certain inspection standards. Heather, I don't know if you want to comment on this one at all because I think this did come up in the statewide housing needs assessment. Yeah, I think that's definitely uh, a challenge. I think voucher holders are um, having a hard time not only just finding units with such a low vacancy rate, but finding uh, units where the um, property owner accepts vouchers um, and also um, getting exceptions for like payment standards and, and the like that that has to go through a process with HUD and in an environment where we're seeing very high rental costs. Um, it, it does create a challenge, um, you know, and then add in the layer of the HUD quality inspections. And so it gets um, unfortunately really difficult for people on the low, uh, the low, uh, extremely low and low income okay. um, renters in New Hampshire. Great. I'm not seeing any other questions. I don't know if any of uh, Heather, Zach, or Kayla have any parting thoughts. Zach, you have your maybe have your hand up to say something. Yeah, just uh, it is brief, it, going back real briefly to Eric's question. I just wanted to took went and looked at the actual tax rates for our region and the median municipal tax rate, the median real rental, uh, the median real property tax rate for our region is lower now than it was in 2000. Um, so you know, just because, you know, I don't know how much, you know, uh, throughout, it's going to be obviously vary throughout community, but, you know, you can't just tie higher, uh, you know, um, higher school, uh, higher cost per pupil for to uh, higher tax rates. Great. Well, thank you. And I'm sorry to kind of curtail the Q&A session, but I know we're coming up against our next session and I do want to leave some time for everybody to take a break. Um, but if you have additional questions, please reach out by email to any of us at the email shown on the slide. Sorry, I didn't clear this with my other speakers ahead of time, but hopefully that's that's OK. Um, and um, these slides uh, will be available on the conference website. Um, and then the other thing I want to say is I just, as I've said all day, um, I just encourage everybody to please fill out the um, evaluation form. I will put up um, in the chat now, um, I have it, um, the, um, the link to our anonymous evaluation form that you can either fill out after this session or at the end of the day. Um, and again, I want to thank um, all the speakers um, and we're going to um, take about a seven minute break 
Um, and we will resume um, our last session of the day, the New Hampshire Housing Toolbox session. So if you want to learn more about specific strategies for addressing all this, all the housing needs that we just talked about, um, we look forward to seeing you back here in a few minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.